Well, hey everybody. Welcome to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad and the Chicago and Northwestern Railway in Wyoming. Today is the 3rd of April, 2024, and this is layout update number 53. I'm Mark Pruitt, welder. I worked on the rock faces at the south end of Wind River Canyon some more this month, added some weight to the S2 Pacific, worked on Powell a bit more, built a whole bunch of turnouts, and hosted an operating session. There were also a few other miscellaneous things I got done. Let's take a look. Oh, and don't forget to stick around for the Cronkite segment right after the closing logos. In last month's update, the canyon was at this point. I bounced back and forth between the canyon and a few other projects, but by the 7th, the south end rock work looked like this. By the 12th, I was trying my hand again at blending the castings together. Seems to be working out a bit better this time than it did on my first effort. By the 18th, I had nearly all the castings in place and blending was going well. I stopped at this point to get ready for the upcoming operating session and haven't got back to it yet. I finally have Decoder Pro talking reliably to my NCE system. I returned the Windows 11 computer and went with a reconditioned Windows 10 unit I bought from Amazon. I haven't used it much yet, but every time I've turned it on, it's connected without a problem. In late January, I installed some of the roadbed for Powell under the Worland area. I didn't work on it at all in February other than to add cork sheets to the plywood and build a couple of turnouts, what with the canyon rockwork and fighting with the Windows 11 computers and all. Right after posting my last update, I did get back to it. On March 4th, I extended track from the bottom of the helix into the east end of Powell and installed the first turnout. Then I began adding track into the town itself. I didn't think I'd have Powell ready for use as a town by the operating session, but I was hoping I could at least have enough track laid to use it as a stand-in for east staging. Well, I did get enough track laid for that. It worked well as east staging. The lines were long enough to park two trains in the area that would run onto the layout during the session. Here's how it wound up after the session. One long train parked on the Powell main line, with another one parked behind it on the Helix. Likely it will be used this way during the June session as well, but we'll see. Plans are to focus on staging construction for the next couple of months. I finally got around to adding the bismuth to the S2. I bought some medium-sized syringes from Amazon, thinking that would give me good control over where the molten metal went when I tried to add it to the locomotive. This was one of the very rare instances where something actually worked out the way I thought it would. The syringe gave me enough control that I was able to inject a blob of bismuth into the cab roof without having to disassemble the entire locomotive. So how did the loco run during the op session? Pretty good overall. In this clip, it's passing over the swing gate on its way onto the layout from Alliance, Nebraska, otherwise known as East Staging. And here, a couple minutes later, it's on the passing siding at Douglas. I still need to tweak it a bit. It hopped the track at the West Douglas switch where nothing else did, and the short train it pulled had it at its limit. I'll search for the reason for the derailment in both the loco and at the switch, and possibly add a bit more bismuth inside the boiler over the gear tower. Speaking of the op session, it was a qualified success. Before the session, those attendees who arrived early joined us for lunch at Pizza Ranch. My wife took the video. During the session, Steve from Evanston and Dave ran Casper Yard. Later in the session, Dave had to leave, so Kevin from Harriman spelled him. Casper has become quite a bottleneck. At one point, we had trains stacked too deep from each direction waiting to get into town. I thought the session was a disaster, but everyone said they had a good time, so I guess it wasn't as bad as I thought. I've got a couple changes planned that I hope will ease the crunch at Casper, and we'll see how those work out in June. 
As the session wound down, some of folks retired to the library to relax and enjoy refreshments and chat. On March 27th, I posted a very short compilation of video clips from the Ops session taken by my wife. It's on the channel. After taking a couple days off after the session, I went on a turnout building spree. I built the three remaining Powell Code 70 turnouts, then spent most of the rest of the month building the 10 Code 83 turnouts I'll need for both East and West staging. I also picked up one sheet of three quarter inch oak plywood and two sheets of half inch ACX plywood to build the staging benchwork. I plan on focusing on staging for most of April and probably well into May as well. I don't expect it to be finished before the June operating session, but it should be well on its way. Why the expensive ACX plywood sub roadbed? I usually use BCX for sub roadbed, which is about $7 cheaper. But staging is going to be here under Casper so I figured the extra expense of the better quality plywood would be worth it as insurance against deformation in the benchwork. This is the plan for staging. There are six tracks in a double-ended yard. The left end, labeled Laurel Staging, is West Staging. The right end, labeled Scotts Bluff slash Crawford Staging, is East Staging. The shortest track, the one at the top nearest the wall, is just a bit over 24 feet long. That's enough for two 20 car trains, allowing 18 inches for locos and way cars on each train. The longest track is about 27 and a half feet long. The turnouts in staging, because of their location, will be powered remotely by tortoise switch machines, the only remotely thrown turnouts on the entire layout. All tracks will have several Micromark ear dot occupancy detectors, which I kept from version 2 of the layout in New Jersey from way back in the early 2000s. That's when this picture was taken. This was the control panel that showed track occupancy and held the turnout controls and showed turnout positions on that old layout. I still have it, so I'll simply install a new face and rewire it to run the new staging yard. This whole yard is going to be a big project. That's why I doubt it will be finished by the June session. Maybe by October's session. I did add one new freight car to the layout in mid-March. This Proto 2000 CB&Q stock car. Just last weekend, I went to Sheridan to pick up these Milwaukee Mikados from Bill. They're BLI Blue Line models, and he gave me a great deal on them. The Blue Line models are the ones BLI set up with a sound decoder to which the owner had to add a motor decoder. Apparently that dual decoder arrangement can be problematic, but hopefully I won't have to gut the electronics and install all new sound decoders. We'll see. I've been woefully short of medium steam like the Mikados, which were the mainstay of power on the division, so these will help a lot. Except for one brass Mikado that Steve took home with him, these are all the locos waiting to go on the layout. Other than the Milwaukee's, they all need sound decoders, and most will probably need repowering as well. Getting all these done will not be cheap. We'll see how far I get with them by the end of the year. The last thing I did for the month was add bullfrog snot to that 10-wheeler I redecaled back in late December, number 1395. It took me four tries. I don't know why it was so difficult. I've done these before and always got good results the first try. But this time the snot didn't dry smooth the first three times. I had to painstakingly remove the dried snot using an X-Acto knife, like you see here, three different times. Finally, I thinned the snot with distilled water and that seemed to help. The fourth application looks good. And that's it. As I said, this month I'm going to focus primarily on the staging yard. I'll try to make some more progress in Powell as well. With luck, I might get the Milwaukee Mikados on the layout. And when I get sick of work on the staging yard, 
I might spend a few hours finishing up plaster work at the south end of the canyon. Hey, don't forget the Cronkite segment right after this. Thanks for watching, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next month. In last month's Cronkite segment, I showed shots of some of my earliest forays into serious model railroading from mostly 1972. Continuing on with that, in 1973, I completed my first ever finished scenery. This followed Lynn Westcott's Zips texturing method exactly. Boy, that was hard to say. In this shot, you see my new pride and joy, an Athern F45 in Great Northern's Big Sky Blue. That was a significant purchase at the time. I had it until just a couple of years ago when I sold it at a North Platte, Nebraska train show. Construction on this layout went on into 1974 until I graduated high school and we moved to Helena, Montana in late summer. When we moved, this layout was given to one of the neighbor's boys. Unbeknownst to me at the time, it would be 47 years before I would have a layout with any finished scenery on it again. That's the layout I'm working on now. And that's the way it was. 1974.